I'd like to talk about the vertical block on the analog scope first. And um, I'll just go straight down the, uh, the list of the controls. You can see here there's a cursor control. This is really technically not a part of this block, but uh, by pressing it on the Instec, uh, if you, anything that you see that has an underline on it means that you press and hold the button for uh, two or three seconds to activate that function. I'm gonna leave those off for right now. Uh, the next button is uh, position, and you can see I've got a, uh, a sine wave on the display. It's approximately two volts, and with the position knob, I can take that and move it up and down to, uh, to a good reference point or a measuring point. And in this case, I'm going to take the trace and just have it kiss uh, this line right here and if I wanted to measure this I could just go straight up and then kind of guesstimate uh, how far above the center line or above this line uh, the top of that trace is but uh, it'd be better and I'm kind of jumping ahead here to take the, uh, the horizontal position knob and move that over until it is on the center graticule and what I'll want to do is count up from where I set my the base of my display. So one, two, three, four. And it's approximately 4.1 divisions. I say 4.1 because um, you're allowed some interpolation on, on the on scopes. Uh, each one of these divisions right now is worth that half a volt value. So at four divisions at half a volt, we're looking at about two volts. Each one of these subdivisions is worth 0.2 of whatever this scale is. So if we look at uh, this, it, since I use the bottom of the line here to begin my measurement, the bottom of the trace, I want to use the bottom of the trace up here to end the measurement. So if I'm looking at this, I would say 4.1 divisions and I would multiply that by the 0.5, so I would come out to approximately uh, 2.1 volts peak to peak. And I'll go ahead and center this back up again uh, to its more or less original position. And use that right there. Okay, um, there's a bandwidth limit switch. Pressing that, currently, uh, if, if, if you can see up here, uh, you can see that this is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope. That means that it should produce uh, any, reproduce any signal input into it with, some, with uh, fidelity up to 100 megahertz. Now, this is, there's some caveats to that, and uh, we're gonna have to get into those a little bit later. Uh, Bandwidth does decrease uh, given certain factors, uh, certain inputs. But if you hit that button, that 20 megahertz button, instead of this being a 100 megahertz scope, it's now a 60, or I'm sorry, a, t a 20 megahertz scope. And this is useful if you're uh, testing things like uh, switching power supplies, which typically have uh, uh, a specification on their data sheets for uh, ripple and noise uh, up to usually 20 megahertz. The, uh, the cursor function is activated when you press and hold that button up there, which uh, again, as, as I mentioned, was uh, we're not gonna discuss that. You have a volts division knob. It's t it's, uh, what it does is it changes the sensitivity of the oscilloscope. Uh, as you turn it counterclockwise, it'll go down to two millivolts uh, for its lowest voltage reading and it'll go up all the way to five volts per division for its highest. This is on a, on a times one function. Uh, most scopes have uh, the 
the values, the voltage values in a one, two, five scale. So right now I'm on a five scale. The next value up should be uh, one volt, and then I should go two volt, and then I should go five volt. So typically it's a one, two, five scale, and you can see that that's true for this one as well. Uh, the variable button will take the scope out of calibration. It's very useful if you want to do rise time measurements, and that's a press and hold function uh, from the underlying indication. And channel one will actually turn channel one on and off. And since we're hooked up to it right now, we don't really want to turn that one off. Um, right below that is the, the ground button, and it does a double duty as a probe times 10 switch. When, you're, when you hit that ground button, what you are doing is you're disconnecting the signal that's coming in on your, your, your connector from the internal amplifiers in the oscilloscope. You are not grounding the signal. You never want to ground the, uh, the signal that you're measuring. It's obviously, it's a short circuit. So you, you want to avoid that at all costs. If I pressed and hold, held this button, I would get a probe times 10 indication. Since again, I'm using BNC, I want us to keep it on times one. So returning that signal and coming down to the next function, you'll see an AC DC button. Currently, we are in AC. So we are measuring 0.5 volts of AC. And what that means is that this scope currently is only looking at an AC component uh, that might be coming into the connector. If I were to uh, hit the DC button, now the scope would look at the AC, uh, look at any input coming in here for a DC as well. Uh, and as you probably remember that AC uh, algebraically adds itself to any DC voltage, so it looks at it almost like it's a ground uh, level. Uh, I do have two volts of DC set into this, and I'm gonna move my trace down. Uh, I'll, in fact, I'll go ahead and ground it, and I'll know that um, this is zero volts. And as a matter of fact, uh, going back to, the, to something we discussed previously, you can see this trace is just a little bit uh, rotated. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this with the trace rotation while I'm at it. And that looks very good right there. So I'm going to put the, uh, take the ground signal, take the ground out, and you'll see that again I have my two volts peak to peak signal. But now I'm going to Hit, hit the DC button and I'm going to add a, D, uh, a two volt offset. Well, how do I know this is two volts? Having set the ground here, so this is my ground point, and then input my signal once again. What I can do is take the bottom of, the, of this trace and set it to the bottom of the, the bottom graticule or the bottom line and then knowing that this is as low, the lowest negative peak that I have if I place this back on you'll notice that it's jumped up from this point to one two three four so just slightly over four divisions at 0 0.4 0 0.5 volts and again we're looking at a two volt a little over two volt DC offset so you do have the capability to, to measure both of those. This is extremely handy when you're dealing with amplifiers that, uh, well, transistor amplifiers as an example, that have a, a base voltage on them uh, for biasing, the DC base voltage, and that would have uh, some kind of a AC signal or a switching signal perhaps, or, well, not a switching signal in, in the case of a bias voltage. Um, if I were to decrease my AC voltage to 100 millivolts peak to peak you'll notice that uh, it's I've still got the offset value so I'm now I'm going to go, let's go ahead and ground my signal once again and set a ground reference point and there we go 
and you can see that the, the signal still jumped up the same two volts, but now you cannot see that, that very small or relatively small uh, AC component. If you wanted to look at that independently, now you have to go back into the DC function, move the scope display up, and then you can increase the sensitivity and make a measurement on the new value. The final section that I'd like to discuss is the trigger level display. This uh, part of the OSCOPE package determines uh, how your scope will trigger, what it will trigger from, and what it's going to, uh, what kind of triggers it's going to accept. It'll also uh, adjust your trigger levels uh, and the slope of the trigger that you're dealing with. So right now, the, the, the scope is pretty much in a standard configuration. It's ATO for, for the modes. So ATO is uh, automatic or auto in the GW Instec. What this mode does is if there is no signal coming into the oscilloscope, in which in this case if there, there is, the, uh, the scope will still display a trace. So I'm going to pan over to the to the trace and right now if I turn the signal off you'll see still see that there's a, a trace showing on the scope. If I went to normal mode NML which is right below it you notice that the trace disappears. It doesn't do anything with the triggering it just determines that you know, if you can see the trace or not. Uh, many times uh, a scope will have a button called a trace find or a beam finder and if you press it it'll tell you that when you're in normal mode, it'll get, actually give you a pointer, say the trace is you know, on top of the CRT, or fired way above the CRT or way below the CRT. TV mode uses the, the sync signals, which are present in, in televisions. And when you use this one, you can use a t uh, your vertical or your horizontal triggers on, from your television. So you can use this uh, scope for triggering uh, for, for troubleshooting televisions. So I'm going to go back to my standard mode of operation, it's ATO, which is automatic, so it's just going to keep everything, uh, it's going to trigger it uh, and show a trace even if there is no input signal. The source determines where, which channel I'm going to use for the, to trigger the CRT. Uh, right now, I'm, my trigger is on channel one, and I'm only viewing a signal on channel one. If I were to hit channel two, notice that the scope now has become, this is called a free running state. The scope doesn't have a, a, a trigger that it can use to, to work off of. If I go back to channel one, the scope triggers normally again. The next one, is this right here indicates that I'm using the 60 hertz power lines to trigger off of. And then finally, the bottom one, the external, uses the external input here to, uh, to trigger from. This can be used for complex signals. Um, one of the examples uh, that I am familiar with from previous experiences of transponders on aircraft have, have rather complex digital signals and the spacing on these can be uh, difficult for a scope to trigger off of without the use of that external, external point. The coupling determines what kind of signal I'm going to accept into the scope to actuate the device with. AC coupling obviously uses AC alone. DC will allow a DC component. The, uh, next to HFR and LFR are high frequency reject and low frequency reject. These are useful when you have a complex signal, for example, a video signal with an audio component. If you have it in high frequency reject, you're going to eliminate any frequencies typically above 40 kilohertz. If you're in low frequency reject, it's going to reject all the signals below 40 kilohertz. Since I've only got a 100 kilohertz signal in there, the scope has trouble now triggering off of that, one, that low signal because it is looking for a higher frequency component, not that lower frequency value. 
But if I go back to high frequency reject, the scope should come back to normal operation and I have a good solid display. Um, we've talked a little bit about adjusting the delay time. At least you saw me doing it in the last section uh, on using the, the, uh, the main alt delay function to see the uh, rise times and the fall times in, of a waveform. And here we have a slope button and the slope just tells the, so to, the scope to trigger on a positive going voltage or a negative going voltage. Right now it's going on a positive going voltage which is obvious because we have a positive going rate form. If I press this, now I've got the slope triggering off the negative side and it shows the waveform not inverted, just triggered at a different point. The, the level knob just tells the scope what voltage do I want to search for a trigger at. If I adjust this, I'm still on a positive going, going trigger, but if I adjust this, you can see that I'm actually changing the voltage that the scope is using to trigger the signal at. I'm now going to make a measurement on a, a trapezoidal wave or a ramp. And right now it appears on the scope as if there is no signal coming in. This is because I've got the time base adjusted so far out from the frequency. If I adjusted the time and the amplitude slightly, there we go. If I adjust the time and the amplitude, you can see that there is there was a wave there the entire time. So how would I measure a trapezoidal wave or a ramp? This is the same technique or principle for measuring just about any wave. You pick a starting point and you set it at a reference, adjust it to that reference point. So in this case, I'll just begin right at that, uh, that vertical line. I adjusted my trace to it. And I want to look for one complete cycle of the wave. And in this case, it just happens that this one wave fits perfectly into all 10 graticules. So 10 graticules across times the two microseconds per division gives me 20 microseconds, so this is a 50 kilohertz wave. Its amplitude, to measure that, I have to adjust it to a, a reference line on the horizontal, and I'll select that line, and then move the waveform until its peak hits the center and I believe I have a a dirty encoder. I'm gonna have to clean that one shortly. There. So here's my reference point, and if I go up on count up the number of divisions on the wave, it's one, two, three, four, five point two divisions at one hundred millivolts per division. So I'm looking at a signal of five hundred and twenty millivolts. Again, it's very straightforward. In the next videos, I'll show you how to do rise time and fall time measurements on square waves using both the, the analog GOS 6103 and the TDS 1002.